Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another 10 Amazing Florida History Facts. This time I'll be taking a look at St. Augustine's Fort, the Castillo de San Marcos. The Castillo is a national monument, one of the best preserved 17th century forts in the Americas and one of the most popular attractions in the state. It's the oldest masonry fort in the U.S. and along with Fort Matanzas located 16 miles or 26 kilometers south it anchored the defenses of the only significant Spanish settlement on the Atlantic coast of North America. Not surprisingly, the massive fort, first begun in 1672, has many surprising elements. So let's take a quick look at ten of them. Enjoy! History Fact Number 1 It was built to protect the looting of the treasure of the Americas. St. Augustine and the Castillo de San Marcos were partly built in order to provide a home port for Spanish ships and troops who helped protect its slow-moving galleons, which were laden with gold, silver, and precious stones from the looted treasuries of the Aztec, Inca, and other indigenous cultures in America. Known collectively as the Spanish Treasure Fleet, its ships moved out of the Caribbean in massive fleets or convoys that were destined for Spain. These fleets operated between 1566 and 1790 and literally moved tons of gold, silver, and anything else of value. Every year, for over 200 years, hundreds of ships would gather at Havana, Cuba to form a new fleet. They'd then head north along the Florida coast, eventually turning east towards Spain. Pirates and privateers would lay in wait and attack the treasure fleet. The fleets were protected partly from gunships based out of St. Augustine. In today's money, it's estimated that the Spanish took well over $500 billion of treasure from the New World. Nearly all of it passed directly by St. Augustine. History Fact Number 2 It's been known by two different names. While the Castillo is nearly 350 years old and has changed hands five times, it has only had two names. The Spanish named the fort after Mark the Evangelist, an early Christian. For centuries, the Gospel according to St. Mark in the New Testament was attributed to him, though nearly all modern scholars consider this to be incorrect. Mark the Evangelist is also the namesake of another Spanish colonial fort in Florida, the remains of which sit in San Marcos de Apalache Historic State Park on the west coast of the state. The small city of St. Mark's in Wakula County is named for this fort. When the British took over Florida in 1763, they chose to anglicize the name Castillo de San Marcos to Fort St. Mark. The British only kept possession of Florida for 20 years when it reverted to Spain. In 1821, the United States took possession of the peninsula, and they named the fort after an American Revolutionary War hero, Brigadier General Francis Marion, more commonly known as the Swamp Fox. Marion is considered one of the fathers of modern guerrilla warfare and is better known today for his legendary and most likely invented exploits rather than for his actual accomplishments. On June 5, 1942, the Castillo had its original name restored by an act of Congress. By this time, it and Fort Matanzas had both been national monuments for 12 years. History Fact Number 3 The moat wasn't designed to regularly hold water. Most all exterior photos of the Castillo show it with a water-filled moat. It makes sense. The reality is, however, that while people expect moats filled with water, there are quite a few castles and forts that have dry moats. As can be seen, the moat is more of a shallow depression between the walls of the Castillo and its outer defenses. It's roughly 40 feet or 12 meters wide, and its purpose is to provide an open area that allows the defenders to clearly see any attackers that make it past the outer defenses. From the three land sides of the Castillo, 
there were mounds outside the moat that would limit the views of attackers. These are known as glacis. The moat was the killing zone that would be completely covered by musket and crossbow fire. The moat could be flooded with seawater by opening floodgates on the sea wall, though its depth was limited. During sieges, it was also used to graze cattle, goats, and sheep. In recent history, and until about 2005, the moat did regularly hold water. Since this was a long time after the Castillo was providing any sort of defense, it seems likely that it was partly for show. The Castillo does look nicer with a filled moat, but it could also be simply in Florida that any spot that's not properly drained will become a lake. History fact number four. The walls are actually quite soft. While one of the better known aspects of the Castillo is that it is made of local stone known as coquina, it may be surprising to learn that coquina is actually quite soft. At first glance, it might even appear to be a poor material for a fort that was designed to withstand heavy bombardment from cannon fire. Coquina is the only stone available in the area, so that's obviously the primary reason the Spanish engineers chose it, but it actually had several desirable qualities as well. It was relatively easy to quarry, quarries were opened on Anastasia Island, and the stone was moved across the river on small improvised barges. Its softness, especially when freshly quarried, means that it's easy for masons to cut and shape blocks precisely as can be seen in these photos. Some coquina is well cemented enough to be classified a fossiliferous limestone. This particular type makes a very good material for building forts, particularly those built during the period of large cannon use. Because of coquina's softness, cannonballs would sink into, rather than shatter or puncture, the walls. The Castillo effectively absorbed cannonballs the way a healthy tree can accept a nail hammered into it. History fact number five. Although built in the Florida wilderness, the Spanish used state-of-the-art technology. San Marcos is a symmetrically shaped, four-sided fortification constructed in a style developed by the French military engineer Marquis de Vauban. In the course of his career, Vauban supervised or designed the building of more than 300 fortifications and managed more than 40 sieges in the latter 17th century. Throughout Europe, military engineers adopted his innovations. His principles for fortifications were widely used for nearly 100 years, while aspects of his offensive tactics remained in use until the 20th century. While it's not directly known to what extent the designers of San Marcos relied on Vauba, his innovations are represented in many aspects of the Castillo. It's surrounded by a wide but shallow moat, and entrance is gained only through a secondary structure and across the drawbridge. Situated directly on the water, San Marcos's main objective was to spot and restrict any hostile actions on the river. The fort was protected by a seawall and was built low enough to minimize its profile as a target for artillery, but high enough to stop attackers from surmounting the walls. Each side could support up to 16 heavy cannon. The walls were thick enough that cannonballs would not be able to penetrate into the Castillo's interior, and because of the plastic nature of the coquina, the enemy's assaults were incapable of shattering the stone. It's still possible to see holes in the Castillo with cannonballs buried deep inside. The Castillo served its function well, especially during the 50-day siege by the British during the War of the Spanish Succession. While the town of St. Augustine was destroyed, the Castillo survived unscathed, protecting both the Spanish military and all of the town's inhabitants. History fact number six. It has an odd American Civil War history. When one starts learning about Florida during the Civil War, it becomes quickly apparent that most of what happened in the young state couldn't have happened anywhere else. Florida was the third state to illegally secede from the Union, doing so on January 10, 1861. By then, the Castillo had pretty much finished its military service. It was used as a garrison and a prison during Seminole Wars, but that's about it. St. Augustine was of little strategic importance, as the city was small and had few resources. 
Knowing it had little value, the U.S. forces garrisoned in the Castillo simply left soon after Florida seceded, leaving only one soldier as the caretaker. A few days later, Confederate forces marched on San Marcos and demanded its surrender. In an almost farcical gesture, the caretaker required that he be provided a signed receipt for the property. The commander agreed. This might have been the only time in U.S. history that a fort changed hands in such a manner during a time of war. The caretaker left, and the Confederates took control of the fort, although they only held it for a little over a year. In March 1862, St. Augustine's acting mayor, Cristobal Bravo, surrendered the city to Union Navy Commander Christopher Rogers. Knowing that this was to happen, the forces in the fort had abandoned it the night before. Thus, the Castillo changed hands twice, during a time of war, without a shot ever being fired. St. Augustine set out the final three years of America's deadliest war without any significant military actions. History fact number seven. Unlike many forts, it has only one entrance. The Castillo's one entrance faces the city and it's defended by both a drawbridge and a ravelin, the triangular detached outer structure that can be seen here. Many castles and forts would also have another entrance, referred to often as a postern or sally port. The postern is a secondary door or gate in a fortification. Posterns were often located in a concealed location which allowed the occupants to come and go inconspicuously. In the event of a siege, a postern could allow defenders to make an attack on the besiegers. They were also useful to support outer defenses if they had not yet been breached, such as San Marcos's seawall. Placed in a less exposed area and often hidden, they were usually small and therefore easily defensible. Initially, the Castillo did have a postern. It was located in the north wall close to the northeast corner. It was fortified by what was described as a heavy door. The postern is shown in a 1675 drawing, only a few years after construction had begun and San Marcos was far from complete. The entire west wall hadn't been built and was only protected by earthworks. The postern was removed as the Castillo neared completion. It's difficult to ascertain why the builders chose to have only one entrance, but there were other changes in the design as well. It may have been as simple as it wasn't necessary. A postern is often used as a shortcut in peaceful times. San Marcos is small enough for that not to be of value. It appears that it wouldn't have proved useful during the times that San Marcos was under siege. The forces that attacked it were large enough that the garrison held a purely defensive position. The military and townsfolk waited in safety until the attackers left. History fact number eight. It was built with the labor of indigenous slaves. Apart from the colonization and the collection of resources, the Spanish considered the Catholic conversion of indigenous people to be a major goal. Spanish Florida had more missions dotted about the countryside than fortifications, including several near St. Augustine. While slavery was forbidden in Spanish colonies, a system called encomienda was developed. Encomienda was a system that provided Spanish leaders with the labor of groups of conquered non-Christians. The laborers, in theory, were provided with benefits by the conquerors, such as food and shelter along with access to the Catholic religion. So technically, the indigenous people held in encomienda were not slaves, but their labor was mandatory and coerced, and they could be killed if they tried to escape. The Castillo was initially constructed over a 23-year span, though construction continued for much of the remaining years Spain held control of Florida. The inhabitants of Spain's nearby missions did most of the labor, along with a few of the poorest Spanish and some Africans who ended up in Florida in one way or another. Tens of thousands of hours of skilled and unskilled labor were used to build the Castillo, as well as Fort Matanzas and the city walls. The Spanish considered the indigenous population to be unsuited for the labor, and many of them were worked to death. History fact number nine. Its four corners were also named for Catholic saints. 
The corners, designed as bastions, which are four-sided structures projecting outward from the main enclosure, allow the troops in the Castillo to defend the main walls with covering fire. The names of the bastions are San Pedro on the southwest corner, San Agustin on the southeast corner, San Carlos on the northeast corner, and San Pablo on the northwest corner. The names correspond to St. Peter, who was an apostle of Jesus and considered to be the first pope, St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the most important early Christian writers and namesake of the city of St. Augustine, St. Charles or Carlo Borromeo, Cardinal of Milan and a reformer of the Catholic Church as a response to the Protestant Reformation, and St. Paul, also known as Paul the Apostle. He is one of the few authors of writings in the New Testament who biblical scholars have truly identified. History fact number 10. The current roof was built much later than the rest of the structure. Known as a terraplane, the stone deck that forms the roof of the interior rooms wasn't built until the 1730s. At that time, Governor Manuel de Montiano ordered a major structural change. When San Marcos was built, wooden beams were used to make the rooms. After a few decades, the wood had rotted to a point where the structure wasn't safe for daily use, let alone a siege. Replacing the wood was 28 stone arches and a stone roof structure that at its weakest point is nearly 3 feet or 1 meter thick. Beneath the new arches were created a room safe for mortar fire that was designed to fly over the walls and down into the interior of the Castillo. The new work was completed just in time to test it against the British forces who attacked St. Augustine from Georgia in 1740. It held even through a 29-day siege. Today, the strong and wide terraplane deals with a different kind of onslaught, about 500,000 visitors every year. Thank you for watching another of Stingray Tom's videos. If you enjoyed it, remember to hit the like button and be sure to subscribe so that you won't miss future videos. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.